Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Classical Christian Thought. I'm your host, Eric Ibarra. So I decided to do a presentation today on something that has been requested of me by a lot of my listeners, and that is for me to talk a little bit more about the situation in the church that we find ourselves today. Uh, it's no news uh, for anybody, any of my listeners um, that the, the Catholic Church is in a state of crises. Now, what is the crisis? What's the cause of it? And what do we have to do in response to it? Though that is the subject of a lot of discussion uh, in the Catholic Social Media Fellowship. And uh, we've got a lot of ideas running around, and we see that tension is growing. Um, my readers will know that from time to time, and it, it's been frequently in the last... Uh, it's been frequent in the last two months or so. Uh, I have written about these these issues, but I don't really bring it to my uh, YouTube audience through the venue of uh, audio or video. And uh, my Patreon uh, subscribers also know that I don't usually bring it to video and audio. Um, so today I'm going to do a presentation um, which is going to be more of a deep dive into diagnosing the problem in the Catholic Church today. I'm not going to be mentioning any names. I'm not going to be talking about specific events in uh, in in the recent past. Uh, I might bring up one or two, but beyond that, uh, my interest in this presentation is to look at what is true about the Christian faith. Because what I believe is missing, what I believe is at the root of the problem in today's Catholic Church, is we've lost the essentials, the basic elementary principles, what the author to the Hebrews calls the arche of the Christian faith, which is the beginnings, the foundation. If uh, you go to Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through, uh, one through uh, the second verse, um, you'll see that uh, he's talking to a community of Hebrew Christians that uh, should not need to be told about the foundations of the Christian faith over again. This is something that should be known by everybody who is basically catechized. And yet today... We find, uh, without mentioning any names, uh, from the, the, the apex down, we see a, a, a large deficiency in the basic RK of the Christian gospel. And so we're just going to dive right in. Before I do that, though, I do want to say that um, there's a couple of updates. Uh, I've put up my... Uh, justification course on my website, ericibarra.com. Uh, so if you go to ericibarra.com, go to courses, you'll see that there's two courses put up right now for uh, Catholics and Protestants who want to study. Uh, they want to look into the debate between Catholics and Protestants on the doctrine of justification. I have a huge course. Um, it takes you through the ins and outs and goes through the Book of Romans exegetically um, and looks at the philosophy and theology behind the debate so that uh, you're basically going to get everything historically and theologically. Um, so share that with your friends if you know anybody who might be interested. And then there's also a whole course on Pope Honorius, which is obviously of interest, especially lately. Um, that's on ericibar.com, top right, go to courses. Uh, for my patrons, uh, there's going to be a revamping of my tiers. Um, I'm hoping to publish that the very day that this gets published. So hopefully by the time this is released, those tiers will be revamped. And I'll also have an attending video describing the why and the what of the revamping. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, I also want to say and remind to uh, remind my patrons that if you go to the Patreon page, or if you go to ericibarra.com, 
at the far right, you'll see resource directory, or if you go to Patreon, the page itself, the resource directory page is the first thing that shows up. It's the pinned post um, because a lot of new subscribers come on there and they get lost trying to scroll down and find what's available. And um, that can get annoying. So I provided just a, a permanent pin that links you to the resource directory that will always be updated with the entire index of what you can find uh, for, for video, uh, and video, video and audio presentations. Uh, I do plan on adding everything, uh, everything that's on the internet, everything I've ever written on that page. That's soon to come. All right. Well, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And you'll see my first slide uh, is the uh, it's the page that uh, is uh, the title. That's the title page. Diagnosing the problem in the Catholic Church, a primer on true repentance, the principle of separation and church discipline. So. You know, I mentioned how what's missing today is a, a basic knowledge of the beginnings, the ABCs of the gospel. And I think that we need to go back to the uh, what repentance means according to Jesus, according to the apostles, according to our patristic tradition, the church fathers and councils and bishops of old, uh, what the Episcopal College has said about repentance. And then also the principle of separation. You know, we we as Catholics, we're always talking about unity, church unity, and how we all have to be one. And we all have to, you know, now we're talking about more, more emphasis on dialogue and, and trying to make firm unity between opposing views and things like this. Well, what, what's missing here is too much talking about the principle of unity and unification. We forget about the principle of separation. And that's equally as important because when you have true unity in doctrine, that separates you from false doctrine. When you have true Christian morals that are being acted out appropriately, you are severing yourself from false Christian morals. And so you have this corollary of separation that comes with unification. And we don't often talk about this uh, especially when it comes to uh, the way that life needs to be conducted in the kingdom of God. So we're going to talk about the principle of separation. And then we're also going to talk about church discipline, which, you know, to many of my listeners, readers, viewers, you'll know, uh, I believe is severely lacking in today's church. And so we're going to go look at the scripture to see what the what the sacred texts have to say about this. And what the um, some of the church fathers have said, and what some of the councils have said, uh, and uh, just one more preliminary remark: um, there's going to be some listeners who are just going to be slightly irked by this presentation, and they might say, "You know, this uh, th this problem here seems to be over the head of a layman uh, sitting, you know, in his chair." at his own private home uh, to talk about. And that, that, that's, there's a point there. However, what I'm going to be sharing with you is very clear. Um, these are not matters of massive dispute. What I'm going to tell you, and I challenge you, if, if you do find yourself scratching your head or balking at just the thought of this experiment, um, go look at what the church fathers have said on the passages that I'm going to uh, share with you. You know, Vatican I speaks about the importance of looking to the unanimity of the church fathers as a guide for what is infallibly true about Scripture. And so I would just challenge you to go look at the Bible and, and look at the church fathers and, and see if the clarity uh, that I will present is open to dispute. I, I don't think it is. Um, you know, it gets to the point sometimes when you're talking with, especially Catholics, that they emphasize so much on the obscurity of things, that we need to have a magisterium. We need to have an official interpreter. If you don't have those things, it's absolute chaos. 
And they may not say that. I know they won't say that, but it act that way in, in many, in many cases, you know, it'd be kind of like if you, if you bro- if you bring like a red octagon in front of somebody and it's got a white line on the perimeter and the letters S T O P in the middle and, you know, bold, thick le- letters. And, you know, you, you offer to this person that we know that this is certainly a stop sign. And then the person responds and, you know, kind of analyzes it a little bit and says, mm, it's possible that it's a stop sign, but we need to go ahead and get an infallible interpreter just to make sure. Um, obviously, such an exercise would be absurd. Um, but, and the feeling that you would get from somebody who would say that is the feeling I'm getting from a lot of Catholics who are responding to the crisis in the Catholic Church today, mainly from those who are in defense of the current hierarchical character uh, or the current hierarchical presentation. Okay. Uh, I'll stop there. So, um, yeah, that was that's the end of that preliminary remark. We're going to go to the next slide here. And uh, so uh, I did want to start off with, you know, uh, Christianity at its roots. You know, we're going back to St. John the Baptist. So um, the idea of repentance, separation, church discipline, uh, that can be traced back uh, into the Old Testament times, of course. But during the days of Jesus, and, and more particularly the, during the time of St. John the Baptist, you had the Qumran sectarians, the Qumran society. And uh, the, the community of Qumran held to community standards of living that, you know, if broken, could be met with discipline. And discipline could be exclusion from meals or even temporary or permanent expulsion from the community. Uh, you can look at some of the cave documents I've referenced there. Um, but the this whole concept of cleansing, turning away from sin, uh, become, you know, turning away from the old, taking on the new, and then also conducting uh, a rule of behavior within a community such that uh, people are accountable to one another or they're accountable to certain rules and canons and they could be exposed to uh, discipline, punishment, uh, medicinal uh, chastising uh, from their peers or their leaders. Uh, that concept was not alien during the, the days and years before uh, John the Baptist, in, in, you know, during his time and uh, with Christ himself. And what we're going to see is that this concept, uh, it carries over into the apostolic church as we move forward in history so we're going to go uh looking at the uh, situation of the pharisees during jesus's day um look at my first bullet proof there bullet point there uh, the pharisees in the new testament era imposed a form of social isolation known as a ban to punish violation of ritual purity laws or doctrinal aberrations the offender was required to exhibit signs of mourning and establish his repentance during the period of the ban in order to qualify for full restoration to the community. The, the only notable distinction between Qumran and the Pharisee tradition among Christians was, quote, the deprivation of the loving community of believers would constitute a persuasive force to lead deviants to reformation and restoration, close quote. Um, I'm getting that from uh, the, the page 305 in the uh, IVPs, uh, IVP Academics uh, Dictionary of the Later New Testament and its developments edited by Ralph P. Martin and Peter H. Davids. Uh, it's a very good resource. And uh, I think there's a new, uh, there's a new revision out uh, for, of recent and that you should take a look at. Um, so we see there, you know, this whole concept from Qumran, you know, the idea of turning away from the world, turning away from sin, turning away from 
the customs of the day, the worldliness of the day, to live within a community where uh, moral purity is of chief uh, aim and you open yourself up to live under accountability to a leadership structure or a structure of rules, uh, which if broken, have attending uh, penalties attached to it in order to maintain the purity and holiness of that uh, community. Uh, that That's clear in the Qumran society. It's also clear in the uh, tradition of the Pharisees, right? And, you know, some, some of my listeners might say, well, yeah, Eric, you know, the Qumran and the Pharisees, you know, the, that's antithetical to Jesus who sat down with uh, tax collectors and prostitutes. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to get there to that question. Um, but uh, what I want to do is, is, you know, tell you about the roots here and then why it is that those principles that I've just described from Qumran and the Pharisee tradition, uh, they carry on into the Christian tradition. And so they actually don't ever get deteriorated. They actually get uh, even stricter, you could say. Um, but let's go into the ministry of St. John the Baptizer, okay? And this is going to be uh, a sec selection from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 4, verses 4 uh, to 19. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just read what St. John the Baptist, um, who some scholars say was reared in sort of like an Essene type uh, tradition, uh, catechesis, and lived basically like a monk. Uh, and we know that from, you know, the Lucan account, Lucan tradition and, and the Matthean tradition. But uh, let's look and see what John the Baptist came on the scene saying and teaching Israel because that's going to play a factor in what we see from Jesus and the apostles. All right. Quote, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, close quote. All right, so we see that John the Baptist was sent to the household of Israel and was preaching repentance. What is repentance? Remember, this is what is lacking in today's Catholic Church, a true exposition, communication, catechesis, of what repentance is. We see here, first, that the people are confessing their sins. And then we see that John the Baptist is preaching repentance in light of certain facts about what is coming. And what is coming to visit the human race is the wrath of Almighty God. And so in order to avoid that wrath, in order to be delivered from the wrath of God, you must repent, starting with confessing your sins. But then he also says, bearing fruit worthy or befitting repentance. So in other words, your behavior needs to change. You need to go from not doing the will of God to doing the will of God. And then he says, don't say that we have... Abraham as our father. This is a, another way of uh, a Jew might say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of Abraham. So I get the blessing just by virtue of the fact of my biological status. Not my works, my biological status. And John the Baptist is saying, no, 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 it's your works. That's why they need to be fit, repentance. And then he says, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. In other words, judgment is ready and imminent. 
And the criteria for passing the judgment is having good fruit, which means living a life which is which pleases Almighty God. Okay, those who refuse to do this are thrown into the fire, according to Saint John the Baptist. Now we get further information on what John was preaching when we look at the Lucan record, Luke Luke three verses ten to fourteen. Quote. He says, so the people asked him, John, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. All right, so what St. John the Baptist tells us here is what he means by repentance. It means doing actions. It means turning. Now, let me pause here for you know, some, of my, some of my Greek readers and some of those who study the New Testament will say, well, Eric, you know, metanoia, the actual Greek word means uh, meta change noia change of mind. That's true, but it's it's sort of like turning the car of you know turning the ignition of a car. You know that is the ignition, but what it does is it turns the car on so that you can move the car. Well, repentance of the mind in the mind um, is like that. It, it's something that goes it's a you know goes together with an outward transformation. And so repentance was obviously, you know, it was even defined as turning away from sin to live in holiness, to live in righteousness, okay? Even though it does mean etymologically change of mind. But you see here that what St. What, what John the Baptist has in mind is not just avoiding sin, it's putting into practice generosity, going an extra mile, being sacrificial, being content, you see, these are these are what will become the law of Christ. These are not just giving up of wrongs. These are giving up all your rights. You know, if you have two tunics, you don't have a right to them anymore. The one who doesn't have anything, he deserves to have one of yours. Not, not in the sense that he deserves it, you know, innately. But under the law of Christ, you are bound to live like Christ and to give to your neighbor, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so these are, you know, repentance means a total changing of the total person. It'll look different for each person. Um, but, you know, for those who are rich, they need to become generous. For those who are, um, who were thieves and stole a lot, they need to work hard for their stuff and then give back like Zacchaeus. Um, so, the idea here is that repentance is a change of your moral behavior and it's got to be radical and we're going to see we're going to see what that means because John, saint john the baptist already gives a hint of that by saying that the axe is laid at the root of the tree and every tree that does not bear good fruit is thrown into the fire so what that means is you can't just express repentance in one area of your life while you harbor sins of another area in your life like you gave up drunkenness but you still have pornography or you gave up pornography, but you still have drunk. You still drink a lot to the point of being drunk. And, uh, you know, you might say, well, you drink less than you did before, but you still drink and you still get drunk. Well, that's not what John the Baptist has in mind. It's not what Jesus has in mind. It's a total turning of the total person. Now, we look at the ministry of Jesus just a chapter later in, in, in uh, the Matthean record. And we see that Jesus is saying the same thing. You know, there, there are some theologians out there who, you know, they try to make it seem like there was like a disjunction between John the Baptist and Jesus. And um, obviously there's some differences, uh, especially when it comes to like eschatological fulfillment, typology, things like this. But the basic message of repentance is the same. We see in Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what is repentance in Jesus? Is it just feeling sorry for your sins? Is it just 
giving some effort to show that you desire to be holy? Or does it mean something a little more definitive and explicit? And we find that he is extremely explicit and more specific on what he means. If you look to, to the record of Mark 9, verses 43 to 48, we read the following from our Lord Jesus Christ. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Close quote. Wow. You should be taken back by this. What our Lord is saying here is that repentance can't be like a, you know, a new adjustment that you made to your life, a new modification. What Jesus is saying here is that vital, you know, vital organs to your daily life that are precious to you, like your hands, your eyes, these are bodily parts that are essential to your daily activities. If one of those causes you to sin, what it means to repent is to get rid of what's precious to you, what you need on a daily basis for the sake of being holy. In other words, the idea that's being stressed here is the, um, the extreme mortification of sin and uh, mortification of the near occasions of sin that you must do in order to be uh, an inheritor of, of God's kingdom and eternal life. Heaven itself, if you want to go to heaven, what Jesus is saying, you must cut off, you know, obviously this isn't literal. <laughs> I'm hoping my listeners are, you know, ha have done some basic studies on these, t on these passages to know uh, for me not to have to go through things like this, but it's obviously, you know, metaphoric. It's obviously talking about um, just the level of extremity, extreme meticulous um, mortification uh, at high costs in order to go to heaven. Um, you know, in other words, there's no dialoguing here with the mitigations of culpability in Christ. Now, I'm not saying that there's that's not legitimate as a concept uh, for pastoral uh, philosophy. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying here is that Jesus doesn't like to talk like that. He doesn't like to really fill in details like this. And there's a reason, because he speaks with a wisdom genre, which tends to be black and white more often than it is not. Um, but it's that way for a purpose, too. Because there is an emphasis that needs to be protected and not blurred with nuance. And, and so what you have here is a bold proclamation of the level to which you have to put effort to gut sin out of your life as a sine qua non to get into heaven itself, according to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Catholic Catechism. Paragraph 1034 says the following. Um, Jesus often speaks of Gehenna, of the unquenchable fire. You'll recall I, that I just quoted Christ where he mentions that in Mark 9. Um, Jesus often speaks of the unquenchable fire reserved for those who, to the end of their lives, refuse to believe and be converted, where both soul and body can be lost. Jesus solemnly proclaims that he will send his angels and they will gather all evildoers and throw them into the furnace of fire and that he will pronounce the condemnation. Depart from me, you curse it, into eternal fire. Close quote. Um, that's in the Catholic Catechism. That's basically a commentary on the section of Mark 9 that I just gave you. 
and it's working in tandem with exactly with what I had said. Depart from me, Jesus says. So, you know, all this emphasis on Jesus' mercy and the way he presents himself, which we are going to we are going to comment on. Uh, and yet here he is at the end of time saying, depart from me to certain people. In other words, they're banished, they're exiled, like Adam and Eve from the, the Garden of Eden planted in the east, sent to the west, departing from God. You know, this is what Jesus says is hell. <clears throat> and uh, there's some more. And, you know, Jesus talks a lot about repentance, but there's another section where he goes into this emphasis even more, and it's more stark. And that's Luke 14, verse 25. He, he begins by saying, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to encounter another king in war, will not first sit down and take counsel, whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if he and if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks terms of peace. So therefore, therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple, close quote. In this selection of the sacred text, our Lord is telling the listeners that repentance, conversion, being one of his disciples, is not something you should take lightly with a mild calculation, with, you know, showing a mild sign of a desire to do so, a desire to be a, G a follower of Jesus. Oh, I think Jesus is cool. I really believe in Jesus. Yeah. Okay, well, have you counted the cost of what it means to be a disciple? Because if you haven't, you can't even be one, according to our Lord. So you, you, have, to, you have to stop and ask yourself, can I even be a disciple before you say you are a disciple? And what is the cost according to Jesus? Well, he says it right there at the beginning. Those who are closest to you. Mother and father, wife, children, brothers and sisters. Those are people who are closest to you, who are going to have significant shaping influence over your life, who you are not going to separate from for no little cost. These are people you owe in many instances. You owe to love them. That's true. Jesus is not calling you to hate them. He says the, hate, the, he, the word hate, but what he means here uh, is that your love for the Lord, your your commitment to the Lord, your commitment to honor, love, and associate with the Lord has to so far outweigh what kind of commitment you have to your closest family that it could constitute a hate and love distinction. Um, and in you know, in the Hebrew world, this is not as stark as it is in the English world, but it's still dichotomic. You know, uh, you need to love the Lord chiefly. That's what it means. And at the end there, the cost is you must renounce all that you have. In other words, coming to the Lord Jesus with repentance, wanting to be his disciple, is like going to, through a toll where you can't go through the toll with anything. You literally have to take everything in your life, put it on a conveyor belt, and it goes through the scan of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he calls an X and yanks out whatever he wants, and he lets whatever is good stay and continue on the conveyor belt. And then you go through the toll, you go through the scan, 
and you come out on the other side, you go through naked, you come out on the other side naked, and you you say, Lord, whatever you want to give me back, you give me back. So if you're not willing to do that, you can't even be a disciple. So when it comes to repentance, how does that apply? What that means is, is your commitment to the conversion experience, your commitment to turn away from sin, to live in meticulous holiness of our Lord, has to be that radical that you have to sit down and calculate whether you can even do it. In other words, our Lord is not giving any respect to any level of someone's gesture that they're willing to try it out. This is not like that. This is this the language here betrays that. I, I hope you, the listener and viewer, can see that. All right. So we're moving into uh, the apostolic preaching in the book of Acts as recorded by St. Luke. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We see uh, the apostle Peter saying, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In chapter next, Acts 3.19, he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So we receive this concept of repentance, but then we see baptism. And what is baptism? Well, you know, uh, I did a deep study in this uh, years ago. Uh, historically, biblically, um, and you, you you can see that the, the whole concept of ritual washing is sort of the uh, um, you, you know the basic uh, logic of this, and it didn't originate with you know John the Baptist or Jesus. There there were baptisms done, and they were all, in a sense, you know, giving the idea of uh, cleansing, ritual purity, entering into a community where you were going to live a holy life. And it's the same in the in the Christian in the Christian gospel the call to repentance and baptism is to receive a, a miraculous cleansing from almighty God through a sacrament through the physical water of baptism under the uh the, the power of grace that is in the church uh given by our Lord and uh, uh, but the way baptisms were done in the early church, it, you know, it, it it's very different than what you see today in, in many cases. But um, in the early church, they had a whole liturgy, you know, and you had to renounce Satan, and, you know, and you, you had to face the West. You know, you'd go into the water and you'd have to face the West first. And, you know, some documents say that you 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 spit towards the west and you say you renounce satan all his works all his pomp and everything that he does and in that is a rejection and a renunciation of sin all sin and then you turn to the east where then you would be baptized in the name of the father and of the son of the holy spirit uh, signifying that you were now going back to eden you know where the garden of eden was planted whereas you face the west where the devil reigns and his power, you know, the, the 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 whole world lies under the power of the wicked one, according to the apostles. And so you would face the West, renounce it, turn to the East, and come into the uh, the church, which is the the uh, the power of Christ's kingdom to redeem, cleanse, and save humanity, and bring them back to the Edenic behavior, uh, following the Lord, trusting in the Lord. Uh, we'll look at what Paul says in uh, Acts chapter 20. Paul's um, continuing this idea about repentance. Um, he says, quote, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we know what Paul's message was about. We see that when 
Jesus commissioned Paul on the road to Damascus. He said to Paul, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which, of which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Close quote. That's Acts chapter 26, verse 16 and following. So you see here that Jesus, according to Jesus, a missionary is sent, an apostle is sent in order to take people who are blind, open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness. Um, in uh, Paul's epistle to the Corinthian church, to Corinthians, he tells us what repentance is, but he also gives an added detail about how repentance can be um, done falsely. So what we have here in these words on the screen, and which of which I'm about to read, is a is a distinction between true repentance and false repentance, or godly repentance versus worldly repentance. Okay, he says the following: For even if I made you the Corinthians sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry. <laughs> though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Close quote. That's 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, verses 8 and following. So you see here that Paul understands two different kinds of sorrow, and there's a godly sorrow, there's a worldly sorrow. The worldly sorrow is still sorrow, but it doesn't lead to repentance, and therefore doesn't lead to salvation. So what is this? what is the sorrow that is godly and leads to repentance? It is the sorrow that has diligence. In other words, it, you're working hard to figure out how to get your life in order. It's not a delicate expression manifesting somewhat of a desire to repent and be baptized or to do penance in the confessional. This is a diligence, meaning this person is putting their whole focus on what they need to do. Everything else is subordinate. Everything else is secondary. Okay, That's what a diligent person does that's what diligence is and then it says clearing of yourselves meaning you want to you just want to clear yourself out of all blame and all, all everything that you owe like Zacchaeus when Zacchaeus repented he showed this diligent clearing of himself like now he wants to give back fourfold of what he stole from people that's clearing himself by over an overabundant sacrifice in his repentance and then it says indignation, an indignation, meaning an anger for sin, an anger towards what you did. So when people come to the church for baptism, come to the confessional, if they're somehow like still like, you know, not, you know, their mind is kind of not really determined on what they're going to do. Um, this is not what Paul calls godly sorrow. Then he says, what fear? Fear, meaning you sincerely fear what's going to happen to you if you don't get your act in order. And 
uh, vehement desire, again, that's diligence, same thing, zeal, same thing, and vindication, in other words, clearing your name. So we see that repentance, true repentance, godly sorrow, it leads to these outward manifestations, all of which are more absolute than anything else. It's unmistakable. We know what this person is like. We know, you know, what he did. Now we know he made a complete 180. I remember when I first had a convert, my, my, you know, I converted to the Lord back in 2005 initially. And um, my mother, who, who uh, spoke to, you know, my pastor and my, my mother came and she was kind of confused, you know, uh, at the time my mom was, you know, she she herself you know was raised in the catholic church but um she she was not well catechized you now bless her heart and she she was concerned she's like eric you know it just seems like you went from a to z like how did you like what did you do and why why is it that you went this far i mean i understand you want to go to church and but it's it seems like there's so much that has changed and you've changed the whole you know, the way you talk, the way you think, what you want to do, um, your career. I mean, everything has changed now because of this. Like, what? why? And and this is the kind of thing that people are going to notice when you truly convert, you see. Um, another section in Paul's letter, this is the first epistle to, to the Corinthians. And here he gives us a, uh, an understanding of what the Corinthian community did when they first responded to the gospel. And so we, we get an understanding of what repentance is, okay? He says, quote, Do you not know that the unrighteous, the adikoi, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Close quote. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11. So you see here that for Paul, it is certain if you are unrighteous, you will not go to heaven, which means, conversely, only the righteous get into the kingdom of God, all right? And he, he reiterates it. These people who practice these sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, "What well, su such were some of you. In other words, every, all of us are unrighteous in Adam. You know, none of us can claim purity by nature, salvation by nature. We're not Pelagians. He says, and such were some of you, were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified. That's talking about the change, the repentance that took place to change these people's lives from sin to righteousness. And uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, um, you know, some basics for living in the kingdom within the church, he says, quote, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this is for this, you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God or Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And look at what he says. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, close quote. Here we're getting a little bit into this principle of separation. Do not be partakers with people who practice these things. Do not have fellowship with them, do you see? 
This is uh, a matter of um, living in the kingdom, separating from those who, who live this way. And we're going to get into more details about that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Paul, in his epistle to Thessaly, or Thessalonica, Thessaloniki, however you want to say it, um, his first epistle, he says this about them, quote, For they themselves, Macedonians and Achaeans, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. Entry, keep that in mind, entry we had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Close quote. That's First Thessalonians 1, verse 9 and following. So here, it was. This is how Paul entered the city and preached. He, they responded. The people responded with repentance, turning to live for Christ and God, and then to wait for Jesus to come back, because He's the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. So Christ is coming, but also wrath is coming. Um. Now, let's get into Jesus uh, and his ministry a little bit, because what we hear today a lot of times, and, and one of the things that inspired me to, 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 to do this talk was I was on Facebook and I saw somebody, again, I'm not mentioning any names, who said that Jesus did not demand repentance from anybody. Rather, he showed love to prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, and eventually they came around to understand that they needed to repent. But that Jesus didn't come around demanding repentance. You know, In other words, they're not, this person wasn't saying that people should not repent. But what he was saying is that Jesus' method was more along the lines of don't confront them, don't demand them from them, don't tell them that they need to do something. Rather you know, start rubbing elbows and shoulders with them and get to know them and be friends with them and show that you're willing to, you know, hang with the homies for a little bit. And then, you know, after a while, you know, you can kind of say, hey, you know, this is what makes me happy. Or you see my joy, this is what makes me joyful. Uh, and then you could introduce, this is one of these philosophies. I mean, it, it really, it, it's not a bad in and of itself. Of, of course we do this, but it, it, when you reduce evangelism to this, it can be a big problem. And um, this is one of the things that inspired me. So let, let, let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew 21, okay? He says, uh, quote, But what do you think? A man had two sons. Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. He's talking to the Pharisees. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterwards relent and believe in him. Close quote. All right. This is vastly important. Because we talk, we, we hear often, you know, Jesus sat with tax collectors and harlots, right? And the kind of idea that's being given there is that you know he didn't come demanding and telling these people that hey listen the wrath of god is coming you need to repent and you need to do it diligently before it's too late they'll say no 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 that's not how he did i mean if he sat down and ate with them that means he was talking about what they wanted to talk about he was sharing conversation with what they wanted to talk about you know he was mixing it up you know just kind of hanging out and uh getting to know people getting to know their problems and their frustrations um that's that's true, okay? But that's not all he did. And we know this for more than one reason. One of those reasons is, is this text right here. He says John came in the way of righteousness. It's the way that tax collectors and harlots responded. They responded to John who was on the way of righteousness. And what did we read from John the Baptist? What was he saying? He was saying, flee from the wrath of God, flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance. The axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's what John came preaching. 
That's what Jesus tells us in this text. The tax collectors and harlots heard and, and responded. So we see that Jesus did not share this view that you see today where you know a lot liberals and conservatives and catholicism you see them saying don't come telling people that they need a you know that there's a wrath of god a judgment to come they need to repent turn or burn and things like this that's not how jesus acted he just sat with sinners and he started off differently and of course yeah we want to eventually get to these things but of course we don't want to start with that or even worse Jesus never demanded people to repent. For goodness sake, look at what Jesus says about John. We know what John said. And, and he says that this is exactly the medicine that the tax collector and harlot needed. They needed to hear that, do you see? And so um, it, it's not possible that uh, Jesus was somehow discordant with John. You know, that in his attempt to meet with sinners, that he did, did something differently and that he had failed to communicate this. The same thing that John did. Otherwise, Christ calls what John did the way of justice, the way of righteousness. Obviously, the king of righteousness is going to do the same thing and even better, right? All right. So we look in Matthew 9 where we see this, right? Matthew 9, verse 9 and following. Uh, Matthew records, quote, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he rose and followed him. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Then Jesus heard that. He said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Close quote. All right. So, yes, Jesus did cross boundaries standards of his day when he sat down just by sitting down to share a meal and submit a culture was showing that you were sharing a life with these people so jesus did do that he identified himself with sinners just by getting baptized by john the baptist so he came into the world of sin and he dwelt among us for sure but what was he saying to these people was he just hanging with the homies or did he call them to repentance? He says it at the end. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, and what did you call the sinners for? To repentance. Isn't that what St. John the Baptist did? Yes. Did he bring up judgment and the need for conversion and the, the necessity of proving it by good works? Yes. Did Jesus call that the way of righteousness? Yes. Is Jesus the king of righteousness? Yes. All right. So enough with that. Um, we see another interaction with Jesus and somebody. Let me take a quick sip of water here. We see another episode where Jesus responded to a paralytic in uh, John chapter 8, verse 10 and following. He says, uh, when Jesus had raised himself up, paralytic and so, i'm sorry not the paralytic but when when jesus this is not talking about the paralytic this is talking about the woman caught in adultery i apologize john chapter 8 when jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman he said to her woman where are those accusers of yours has no one condemned you she said no one lord and jesus said to her neither do i condemn you go and sin no more close quote that's a classic text, right? Everybody knows about that. But he says, go and sin no more. All right. Does Jesus mean something by that? Well, in his, he does something similar in uh, with the paralytic in John chapter 5. 
John chapter 5, verse 8 and following, we read, Jesus said to him, the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Close quote. That's our Lord talking to the paralytic. Okay, what if you heard somebody? I mean, if you saw a, a priest heal a man from being paralyzed, and they get up and walk, and then the priest said, "You are made well, but go and sin no more, lest something worse happen." I think you'd have a lot of shocked expressions in the people's face who heard who hear him. I think. Jesus here is telling us what he means. And if you look at the patristic commentaries, um, they're all saying the same thing. That this man, if he continued to sin and went back into a life of sin, he could have had something worse happen to him as a form of punishment from Almighty God. Ultimately, everlasting hell as we read in other passages. All right? So this is what he was telling the weak and the sinners that, that came to him. Um, we're going to move into more of like the principle of separation and church discipline. Now we talked a lot about repentance, what it is, um, how Jesus proclaimed it. And, uh, I'll let the reader decide whether you think that your, um, if today's presentation of repentance in the Catholic church, let alone your particular community, if it's, if it adequately communicates what I just said. And read. I didn't even have to interpret any of that for you. It's so clear. Go look up, go look at all the patristic commentaries and everything I've said so far. You're going to see perfect echo of what I'm saying. Um, so we, we've nailed down repentance, okay? What it is. It's total. It's absolute. It's radical. It's, um, it's turn or burn style, you know? Uh, mortification to the point of losing limbs, metaphorically giving up your whole life, renouncing everything as a sine qua non condition. You know, it's, it's free to sign up, costs everything. That's what Jesus said. If you want to be his disciple, you got to count the cost. Now we're going to move into the principle of separation and uh, church discipline. And we're also going to see how this is going to be at stark contrast with the experience of many Catholics today. And you're going to have to ask yourself, why? Why? Why is it today that the Catholic Church seems to be in contrast with this? Okay. Now, in my diagnosis of the problem, uh, I don't need to go through this particular person said this at this time and this date. I'm going to the root of issues, the foundation of issues. What I'm talking about here are matters that the Catholic Church will take many years to return to. Uh, in her in her practical reaching out to the world. Um, but we have to do this. We have to go back and look at the sources and what pure, purified apostolic Christianity taught. Okay. All right. Matthew 18 says the, the following. <clears throat> this is Jesus teaching the apostles. He says, quote, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican or a tax collector. Verily I say unto you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's Matthew 18, verse 15 and follow. So we see here that in the Christian community, among the brethren, among the, the male and female baptized community, sin cannot be left to, free to reign. This is a This is a concept that is going to be difficult for a lot of my listeners. Uh, a lot of people have been under this impression that, you know, 
you, you know, if you come into church, you need to be focused on yourself. Don't be focused on the sins of others. Okay, there's a major level level of truth to that. Jesus says, "Don't you know? Look at the, uh, you know, you know, look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a whole log in your own eye, right?" So that's hypocrisy. But um, if if you're living in the life of Christ and uh, you you see someone in sin, caught up in a certain trespass, like Paul says in Galatians six. You can't just sit there and let it go, all right. In some cases, prudence and discern discretion, discernment will allow you w- would lead you, you know, perhaps leave it alone. Um, but in most cases, it's going to deserve attention, you know, especially if you are uh, not caught up in your own trespasses, right? But what Jesus is telling us here is that people who don't want to repent of their sins ultimately should be held accountable to it, to, to the rule of repentance. And if they don't want to, to, to repent, you can't just say, well, you know, Jesus sat with tax collectors and sinners, so we're not going to tell this guy never to come back. We're not going to tell this person not to receive communion. Um, that's not what the, the wisdom of Christ here is saying. No, eventually, if it's proven that he doesn't want to repent, not only is he not going to receive communion, he is to be banished by the community as and looked upon as a heathen and a tax collector. In other words, this person is being excommunicated or disfellowshipped from the community of Christians. That's our loving Lord who's teaching this. Principle of separation. Not everyone should be unified. In the D.K., which was an early document of early Christian teaching, we read uh, one moral exhortation, quote, uh, and reprove one another, not in anger, but in peace, as you have it in the gospel. But to everyone that acts amiss against another, let no one speak, nor let him hear anything from you until he repents. But your prayers and alms and all have your deeds so, so do as you have as you have in the gospel of our Lord. Um that's uh, chapter 15 in the DDOT case. So you see here, we're to reprove one another, you know, not angrily, peaceably, peaceably leading and encouraging each other. And if anybody acts amiss, meaning if anybody doesn't want to repent, don't even speak with that person. That's what it says. Again, the principle of separation, it's moral purity. You ostracize certain people in order to help them through a medicinal act of discipline and in, in hopes that they'll repent. This is a concept, like I said, back to the Qumran, the Pharisees were doing it. John the Baptist taught it. Jesus taught it. We ju- we see it in the DDK, right? Early Christianity. Basil the Great comments on, uh, he uses Matthew 18 to apply to a situation that he was dealing with in his time in letter 288 uh, of his epistolary. He says, quote, when public punishment fails to bring a man to his senses, or exclusion from the prayers of the church to drive him to repentance, it only remains to treat him in accordance with our Lord's directions. Our Lord's directions. As it is written, if he neglect to hear even the church, let him be unto you henceforth as a heathen man and as a publican. Close quote. Now, Basil continues, now all this we have done in the case of this fellow. In other words, Basil's talking about how he 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 they applied the Lord's directions in the case of a particular man. Basil goes on. First, he was accused of his fault. Then he was convicted in the presence of one or two witnesses. Thirdly, in the presence of the church. Thus, we have made our solemn protest, and he has not listened to it. Henceforth, let him be excommunicated. Further, let proclamation be made throughout the district that he be excluded from participation in any of the ordinary relations of life, so that by our withholding ourselves from all intercourse with him, he may become altogether food for the devil, close quote. So we, again, with this very concept that I'm saying here, notice how Basil the Great looks at Matthew 18 and the instructions to hold people accountable to the way of righteousness. And if they fail and they refuse to abide by that, to repent and abide by the rules, um, 
eventually they have to be publicly excommunicated. Basil calls this our Lord's directions. The loving and merciful Lord Jesus. Okay. So today, okay, I'm just going to make a hint here. Today, when you have leaders who see sin, they see heresy, they see schism brewing, and they, they don't do anything about it. What does that tell you that they're doing with our Lord's instructions? And what kind of man, what kind of shepherd knows the Lord's instructions and doesn't do them? What happens to those shepherds? Well, I'll let you answer. <clears throat> We're going to go to uh, one of the most one of the most clear passages in the New Testament about this principle of separation and church discipline in the writings of Saint Paul. Okay, following in tandem with what Basil said of our Lord's directions, these are apostolic instructions or apostolic directions on what to do. Let me take a quick sip of water here. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and following, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so named as named among the Gentiles, that one should have their father's wife, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he hath he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you taken away from among you for i verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already he judged already as though i were present concerning him that hath done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to, not to have company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters, for then ye... Then must ye needs go out of the world to get altogether. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if I'm any man that is called a brother. Do not keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer, reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such a one, know not to even eat with them. Do not even eat with them, other translations say. For what have I to judge them also that are without? Meaning, Paul doesn't judge people on the outside, the, the non-baptized. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among you yourselves that wicked person, close quote. All right. The, the instructions here can't be any more clear, right? We say here, we see here that Paul says that the, the Corinthians have this man who's obviously in relations, non-marital relations, um, in you know, sexual intercourse with his stepmother, his father's wife. That's it's obvious that it's the stepmother. And instead of mourning, the Corinthians were puffed up about it. And Paul says you should have been mourning and you should have taken this man away from your, your, among you. Here we go again, the principle of separation. Some people cannot be with Christians in the church who are, and, and specifically the baptized who act out in, in penitent lifestyle, okay? 
Paul says that he don't even need to, he don't even need to be there. He doesn't even need to practice Matthew 18 and the steps of one on one, two, two and three on one, and then tell it to the church. He says, I've already present in spirit judged this man. Now, so there are certain sins where it goes right up to the top real quick. All right. And I would suggest that this involves all kinds of, you know, especially um, doctrines that are of, you know, teaching sexual uh, deviant uh, uh, deviances, like, you know, what we see from certain hierarchs today in the church about, you know, aberrant lifestyles, unclean lifestyles. To do it or to support it, it's the same thing, right? Well, Paul, for Paul, if you don't act swiftly, that these people be removed from the church, you should be mourning. You should be ashamed. That's what Paul's telling the Corinthians. And then he says, you need to banish this man, not privately, publicly. That's why he says, wait until you've gathered together. And then, with the power of our Lord. This is the power and authority of the merciful, crucified, and risen Christ, the King of glory. With his power, banish this man from the community. It's called th delivering such a one to, the, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. We'll get into what that means in a little bit. In order, for the, in order for this man to repent, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Then he proceeds to give them the principle of separation. If you have a little leaven in dough, it leavens the whole lump of dough. In other words, if you allow sin and you into the community and allow it to infect everyone, th that, that's not the way to go. That's, not, that's going against the Lord's will. So in other words, what is what do you have to do? What does he say right there in the middle of the page? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Take out that little leaven so that you could be a new lump without any leaven. It's the principle of the pure church. The church cannot be tolerant of open, unrepentant sin in the community. <clears throat> then he's, then he, he tells you don't keep company with the baptized brethren that live aberrant lifestyle. Don't even eat with these people, okay? This is the principle of separation. And these are not just Paul's recommendations. These are the instructions from the Lord, instructions from Paul. And look at that line there, the last line. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Boom, principle of separation, church discipline. And another in another section of the New Testament, uh, Paul's epistle to, to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, verse 20, says um, that some having faith and a good conscience, uh, some have rejected this. Concerning the faith, they have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander. Then he says what he did without, with both of these. He says he delivered them to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme, close quote. There you go. Principle of separation. So Hymenaeus and Alexander apostatized. They made shipwreck, <laughs> made shipwreck of the faith. And Paul didn't say, you know, hey, guys, you know, I know I understand these things happen. Um, my door's always open. You know, come to me when you want. No, he delivered them over to the power of Satan. He excommunicated them from the community of light, the church where the power of our Lord is exerted to save mankind. Paul delivered them over to the outside of that, which is Satan's domain, that they may learn not to blaspheme, meaning that they may learn to repent and be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, in the D.K. Bible, so I, I, I have this. I bought it for my wife. Um, she loves it. I'm, I'm always looking at it. Uh, to see what the common say, commentaries say. Um, when you look under 1 Corinthians 5, the section we just read, uh, this is what the commentary says on the Corinthian issue with the man who was in relations with his stepmom. Uh, and by the way, this is published by Ignatius Press, um, so their editors obviously have Episcopal oversight um, and confirmed that nothing is is with error in, this, in these books. 
Uh, that is, uh, of a, you know, nothing contradicts Catholic doctrine. Um, the commentary says this, quote, the Corinthian Christians did not exclude the perpetrator from their community. For this reason, Paul scolded them for their excessive tolerance. Paul ordered the excommunication in absentia, in absence. In being discharged from the church, the man was cut off from both the sacraments, the source of grace, and the community. The hope was to bring the individual to repentance. When a baptized Christian persisted in a scandalous sin that presented a danger to the souls of the believers, Paul instructed the local church to excommunicate the individual. Close quote. Again, principle of separation. In uh, Catholic Commentary on Holy Scripture, a new Catholic Commentary on Holy Scripture, page 1148, we read the following on the, on the, the, the terminology of delivering over to Satan. What, the, what does that mean? Quote, seemingly the expulsion from the community was itself handling over to Satan, cut off from the community which is subject to Christ. The sinner is thereby subject to Satan. For the destruction of the flesh gives part of the purpose of the punishment, the destruction of the sin in the man. Flesh is accordingly the sinful aspect of man. Spirit is the man under the aspect of his having been sanctified. Thus, the punishment is inten intended is intended to move the sinner to remorse so that he will be saved at the general judgment. If he is thus saved, the purpose of the imposition of the penalty will be fulfilled. The penalty is therefore not vindictive, but medicinal. Close quote. Other fathers have had different interpretations. Some, some believe it is like for the destruction of the flesh, meaning for, uh, for, you know, um, for pains to be inflicted on the body leading them to repentance. Either way, the same idea. <laughs> we get this principle of separation also in some other texts in the Pauline corpus. In Romans 16, we read the following. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. There you go. Close quote. Note them. Oh, I don't want to judge anybody. What does Paul say here? Take note of who they are and avoid them. Okay. Apostolic command. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and following, we read, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. 1 Timothy 5, Paul says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that he, so that the rest also may fear. In other words, when an elder is rebuked, do it in the presence of everybody. Why? So that everyone may fear. That's what Paul says. <clears throat> there are some instances in the Acts of the Apostles where you have discipline being applied. And um, what's being communicated to the listeners, to the viewers of the people there, is definitely the idea of separation, the idea of uh, the pure church, and also that the Lord takes serious um, the conduct of his, of his, of his disciples. Uh, in Acts 5, we read the following. 
but and this is about the situation. I, I should give just a brief intro here. This is about the situation between Peter and Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. As you know, they were, you know, they had lied about certain the amount of money that they were going to give to the church. And um, Peter called them out on this the sin of lying. And we, we read the following. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him, carried him, and buried him. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard such things, close quote. Wow. Just picture yourself there wondering, I wonder what it's like to be around the Apostle Peter when he's in action. Let me go back 2,000 years just to see, right? And then you come into this situation where they call Ananias to be held accountable for his lie. And then, boom, Ananias drops dead. And we know that Peter knew this was going to happen because he knew it was going to happen with the Sapphira. So he must have had immediate revelation from our Lord that our Lord intended to kill these two people. And it happened by an administration or an execution from Peter, the leader of the church. Okay? Death came upon these two people. And the result of that, and it's obvious that the Lord intended this, is that fear came upon all those who heard these things. What kind of fear? The fear that what the apostles were doing was animated and supported by the God of heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that he is the one who searches the hearts and minds of his people. And he will even chastise them to the point of disciplining them in this way. <clears throat> Another act of dis discipline in, in the apostles in the Acts is Peter with Simon Magus. In Acts chapter 8, verse 21, following Peter, it says, But Peter said to him, Your silver perish with you. This is Simon Magus who was trying to you know, get the power of the sacraments so he could sort of make money from it. Your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of our heart may be forgiven you or the, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, close quote. Oh, but I, I thought we couldn't judge a man's heart. Well, look at what Peter said. For your heart is not right before God. Your actions manifest your heart. All right. Let's look at what John, so I mean, we talked a lot about Paul, Jesus, St. John, the Baptist, Peter. Let's look at what St. John says about this principle of separation. Okay. In 2 John, 2 Epistle, um, verses 9 and following, we read, quote, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Close quote. Now, 
This is a tough one, right? What? Just by greeting a heretic, I share in his evil deeds? Well, it's obvious what John means here. It means somebody come into your house in order to have fellowship with you, in order to be in communion with you. Okay? If you communicate with somebody who transgresses the doctrine of Christ, which we have plenty of people doing today, openly, publicly, without remorse, claiming support from the hierarchy and the magisterium. All right? And yet John says that if you commune with them, we're not even talking about not condemning them and you know being negligent in other respects, just maintaining communion with them. The words he uses are greeting, greeting them. Obviously, I think he means communing with them as Christians, as if they're both Christians in good standing. If you do that, if you receive these people, even in the papal palace, and they are like this, and you do not act swiftly, how can it be that what St. John says here does not apply? That's of major concern, is it not? <clears throat> Paul says in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 and following, quote, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject, reject, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned, close quote. This, this in Paul, ends up being a, a standard uh, sort of paradigmatic text <laughs> for how to deal with heretics and schismatics um, in the patristic era and all the way into the uh, second millennium can canonist tradition. Um, but... You know, obviously, uh, here we go again, principle of separation. Not all are welcome. You understand, people? It's, it's it, You need to understand this. Not everyone is welcome. We see that in Jesus. We see that in Paul. We see that in Peter. We see that in John. We saw it in the DDK. We're going to see it in the patristics. Not everyone is welcome. The wolves must not be welcome. I got that. I remember my pastor is the first one who brought that to my attention. How could it be that everyone is welcome? Okay. Now, you know, if somebody wants to clarify and say, well, what we mean are seekers and inquirers. All right. But how often do the people who shout from the rooftops all are welcome also put this into application in their community not many okay so it's worth pointing out saint b the venerable <clears throat> one of my favorite biblical commentators uh, born in the seventh century died in the eighth he says the following uh, he comments on that that one text from saint john uh, saint uh, the second john that i quoted just now and also titus three from paul he says the following, uh, John, St. John the Apostle, John put into practice also through his actions these things that he taught in words about abominable schismatics and heretics. For someone who heard him, the most holy and brave martyr Polycarp, bishop of the people of Smyrna, tells that at one time when he entered the baths at Ephesus to wash and saw Serenthus, that's a heretic or a schismatic, he saw Serenthus there, he immediately leapt up and departed without washing, saying, let us flee from here, lest the very baths in which Serenthus, the enemy of truth, is washing, fall down. Close quote. When the same Polycarp had also on one occasion chanced to meet Marcion, who said to him, Acknowledge me. 
he answered, I acknowledge you. I acknowledge the firstborn of Satan. The apostles and their disciples then used such great caution in religion that they would not allow anyone to have even, even the contact of a word with any of those who turned aside from the truth. Just as Paul also says, avoid the heretical person after the first and second reproof, knowing that such a one is wrong and commits sin since he is self-condemned. Close quote. My citation there is at the bottom. So look at what Bede is saying here. I, I chose this on purpose because I, I, saw, I quoted um, 2 John and then I quoted Titus 3 from Paul. And then I found I, I, I found Bede in his commentaries um, putting these two texts together, but also giving us this wonderful point. John the Apostle gave those instructions not to greet those who hold a different doctrine, right? Lest you share in their guilt, right? Well, who was a disciple of John? Polycarp, right? Uh, Polycarp heard John. Well, how did a disciple? How did a disciple of John act when he was around heretics? Well, <laughs> we're told, aren't we? You, I just read to you the reaction he had, and Bede says makes this point. He says, "Look, the people who were there with the apostles." They took such great caution in religion that they would not allow anyone to have even the contact of a word with any of those who turned aside from the truth. My, 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 where have we gone? Let's go to Revelation and we'll hear from the mouth of our Lord himself. Here we have the most post-ascension, divinely inspired record of our Lord. You know, because lots of New Testament doctors and professors and theologians out there, um, they tell us about the meek and mild Jesus, you know, and how today he's just wanting to spread his love and acceptance. All right. Well, let's go to the most post-ascension, divinely inspired record of our Lord. And let's see what he has to say. What does he have to say about tax collectors and prostitutes in the community of the church? All right. In Revelation 2, verse 1 and following, our Lord says this, quote, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, I know your works your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear evil men, but have tested those who call themselves apostles, but are not, and found them to be false. Yet this you have, you, ha you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, close quote. So he's, he's commending them because they cannot bear evil men. In other words, they can't tolerate evil men. They've tested certain people, and they've excluded them from the community. So Christ is supporting those, those actions. Then we see that they hate the works of the Nicolaitans. Those are people who lived in, they taught licentiousness, that you, know, you didn't have to keep the moral law meticulously. And, and Christ says he also hates that, right? In uh, Revelation twelve, verse uh, Revelation two, verse twelve and following, we read the following from our Lord, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice immorality. So you have some, so so you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Here you go again, close quote. 
Here you go again with the message of repentance, the doctrine of separation. The church needs to purify itself. Otherwise, Christ is going to come in wrath. In Revelation 2, verse 18 and following, we read, the, we read this from our, our Lord. Uh, quote, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches mine and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. Close quote. Immediately, what comes to mind is the Ananias and Sapphira episode. Fear spread through all the, wor the, the, the world of Christians at that time in Jerusalem. Okay? This is what our Lord is teaching. You can't just have everyone is welcome. Um, if you sin boldly, it let it, 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 it's okay. And you can kind of, you know, let the wheat and the tares coexist. That's not what our Lord is teaching here, do you see? All right, moving into church history a little bit. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We're just going to kind of go through a few more things, and this is going to be wrapped up, okay? I'd love to go through more of church history. If you want me to, let me know in the comments. Uh, I might do that for my, Patreon, my, my, my patrons. Um, it takes some work to do this, but let's look at what church history tells us. All right, episode with Nestorius, brief commentary on the context. Nestorius of Constantinople begins to preach that Mary is the bearer of the Christ, not the bearer of God. Christotokos, but not Theotokos, right? Cyril of Alexandria reports this as a severe heresy. The Pope at the time, who gets the report from St. Cyril, acts swiftly. And we're going to read from a letter from the Pope at the time on what the Pope did with Honor with with uh, Nestorius, and we're going to see how Pope Celestine understood repentance, the principle of separation, and church discipline. Everything we've covered so far, from Qumran to the Pharisees to John the Baptist to the apostles to Jesus. Okay. Let's read what, what Pope Celestine says. He says, this is a letter to St. Cyril about Nestorius, just so you have in mind what's going on. All right, quote, What can he, Nestorius, now do while preferring to serve his own bent rather than Christ, chose to infect the congregation entrusted to him with the poison of his preaching? Although he ought to have read and to hold that perverse inquiries do not contribute to salvation, but work to destroy souls and should therefore be shunned rather than pursued. Nevertheless, we ought to rescue, if, if we can, one who is rushing to the precipice, or rather is already at the precipice, from where he may fall, lest we hasten his falling by not going to help him. Christ our God, whose birth is the subject of the debate, taught us to exert ourselves over a single sheep, wishing us to rescue it even on our own shoulders, lest it become to prey of a ravenous wolf, become the prey of a ravenous wolf. How much then will he who taught us to hasten, hasten to save a single sheep, wish us to exert ourselves on behalf of the shepherd of these same sheep. For he, forgetting his office and title, has turned himself into a rapacious wolf, desiring to destroy the flock which it was hit duty to guard, which it was his duty to guard. We ought to remove him from the sheepfold if he cannot correct him as we wish, if we cannot correct him as we wish. Let one who corrects himself be given hope of pardon, for we prefer that he turn back and live. 
if he does not himself destroy the lives of those committed to him. But let one who persists receive an unambiguous sentence, unambiguous sentence, for one must excise a wound that harms not just a single limb, but the whole body of the church. We assign the authority of our seat to you. May you, therefore, acting in our stead, execute this sentence with strict rigor, either within 10 days, counting from the day of this indictment, he is to condemn by a written profession his own depraved sermons and confirm that he holds the same faith about the birth of Christ our God as is held by both the Roman church and of your holiness. If he does not do this, a prompt and total expulsion from our body of one who has refused to accept treatment by physicians and has hastened as an evil bearer of pestilence to both his own destruction and that of all those entrusted to him. Close quote. This, this is a uh, quotation from the letter, one of the letters of Pope Celestine to, to St. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Father Richard Price in uh, Liverpool University Press's The Acts of the Council of Ephesus, 431, page 135. All right, so in this text, all right, what we see here is Pope Celestine recognizing that Nestorius is not just an infection of himself, he's an infection of the whole church. Obviously, the sheep within the Patriarchate of Constantinople, but the wider world of Christians. This is a scandal, right? And then he tells, he, he says that it calls for a rush. See, look at the middle. Rush, you know, this is, this is, we have to hasten to uh, save this situation. Not, um, not uh, wait for this person to rush to their own destruction. We're supposed to rush ahead of their rushing. That's how Celestine sees this. It's urgent, requires action immediately, right? And he says that, uh, you know, a total unambiguous expulsion and sentence, one that's not unclear, but is direct and pertinent to the error of Nestorius, of what he was teaching. And this is to be done, not just for Nestorius' sake, but for the sake of the whole body, all the sheepfold of Christ. Now, I mentioned, I won't mention any names, but I did say I'd have one or two exceptions to that. What we see today going on in the Catholic Church, in some places, I'll name one, the German bishops. There are other conferences of bishops who have done similar. For years, years, and I'm not talking just about the recent issue with same-sex blessings, okay? There are other things that have been around for a long time, not just under the pontificate of Pope Francis, by the way, that deserve attention and are not getting attention. I just want to ask the listener and the reader to see the contrast of where people were, where our saints were in the 5th century. And, and, and let me just tell the person who's, again, balking at what I'm saying, saying, well, those were different times, different contexts, calls for different kinds of tools in the medicine box. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Just look at the contrast of where people were at this time. Basic Christian common sense, following the basic clear instructions of our Lord, the apostles, and what we see going on today. All right, let's move on. I'm moving on to a very controversial part of history. This is actually the um, the excommunication. I say quote unquote excommunication because it, it did not actually, you know, 
get officially promulgated. Um, but this was how the Fifth Ecumenical Council reacted to Pope Vigilius when Vigilius was defending uh, heretical documents, or at least one heretical document. And um, this changed because Vigilius later on ended up re renouncing his former view um, on this matter. But there's a principle of separation that I want to communicate here um, from what these bishops do when the Bishop of Rome at the time was defending in piety, uh, in, in their words. Okay, So let's read. Um, and this is coming from the Acts of the Seventh Session of the Council of Constantinople 553, which is counted as one of our ecumenical councils. Quote, He, Vigilius, made himself alien to the Catholic Church by defending the impiety of the aforesaid chapters, the three chapters, separating himself from our from your communion. Since, therefore, he has acted in this way, we have pronounced that his name is alien to Christians and is not to be read out in the sacred diptychs, lest we be found in this way, sharing in the impiety of Nestorius and Theodore of Mopsuestia. According we Accordingly, we earlier made this known to you by word of mouth, but now we inform you in writing through our officials that his name, Vigilius, is no longer to be included in the sacred diptychs. We ourselves, however, preserve unity with the apostolic see, and it is certain that you also will guard it for the charge to the worst, for the change to the worst, in Vigilius or in anyone else, cannot harm the peace of the church's close quote. That's on page 101. All right, so what we see here, number one, is that they believed that a pope who gives into heresy enough separates himself, condemns himself from the church, okay? And that they can recognize that. That's number one. Number two, they also find the same motivation of the Apostle John and his second epistle, where he says, do not even greet the heretic, lest you share in his sins. Look at what they say there in the middle of the page. Lest we be found sharing in the impiety of Nestorius. So if they are in communion with Vigilius, who defends Nestorian documents, they see it as them sharing in the guilt of Nestorius. So the same logic of the Johannine logic, that we read in the second John, um, and which we saw how Polycarp put into practice. That's what was driving the logic of this sentence. Again, principle of separation, church discipline. All right, the last text I'm going to bring to the fore here is from uh, Maximus the Confessor. During his trial, when he was put under trial by the Monophysite Imperial representatives and you know those of you who don't know the story maximus is a saint great theologian who defended diatheletism that christ had two wills according to his two natures um at a time when the imperial leadership of the church was teaching monotheletism one will and so they put maximus under interrogation they try to push him into some some kind of a nuanced monothelitism, um, but he refused. And one of the things that they did to try and get him to come along was they tried to say that Rome also agreed to have communion with the See of Constantinople. And so that if Maximus would not commune with the patriarch, who is a monothelite, Maximus is not in communion with Rome either because Rome communicates with, with Constantinople, D.C. All right. So... The first thing that Maximus tells them is this. I shall sooner agree to die than, apo than to apostatize in any way from the true faith and therefore suffer torments of conscience, close quote. That's on page 62 of the book there listed. Um, uh, uh, this is a 
from the life of our Holy Father Maximus the Confessor. Um, actually, it's a it's part of the um, the the record of uh, a disciple of Maximus named Anastasius the uh, Apoc. I can't I can't always get this Apocryasarius of Rome. He was um, a representative of the Pope living in uh, the East, but he had been with Maximus as a disciple. Um, he recorded what Maximus said in this interrogation. That's this is the first thing he said. I'll rather die, right? Then the envoys or the interrogators say, but what will you do, Maximus, inquired the envoys, when the Romans are united to the Byzantines? Yesterday, indeed, two delegates arrived from Rome, and tomorrow, the Lord's Day, they will communicate the holy mysteries with the patriarch of Constantinople, close quote. Do you see what the envoys are saying here? They're saying, hey, look, two delegates are already in the city. This Sunday, they're going to celebrate Holy Mass with the patriarch that you won't communicate with because you think he's a heretic. So how does Maximus respond? The saint replied, even if the whole universe, so not just the five patriarchs, anybody, even if the whole universe holds communion with the patriarch, I will not communicate with him. For I know from the writings of the Holy Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit declares that even the angels would be anathema if they should begin to preach another gospel, introducing some new thing. Close quote. All right. Now, I'm not going to get into whether Rome really did get involved in heresy here. Um, I have... I, and I've, Written a whole book on the papacy. You're free to go and get that from the St. Paul Center of Biblical, St. Paul Center, the 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 the, the St. Paul Center of Biblical Theology, um, Emmaus Road Publishing, uh, and see what I say about these events in history. You know, including the one on Vigilius. But all I want to get across here is that you see how in church history they understood, you know, like Celestine with Nestorius. This has got to be acted upon fast. You know, souls are on the line. We saw with Vigilius that if you commu even commune with somebody who defends heresy, you can be liable to sharing in their guilt, let alone, you know, just being slow in dealing with their heresy. And then with Maximus, you see that, you know, he's not even willing to commune with heretics. He'd rather die, you know. So what we see here, this is kind of the end of my uh, presentation. So let me uh, remove, okay? So what we see here is um, true repentance. We saw this according to the sacred text. Um, I brought in some patristic texts to help. Uh, we see the, the repentance in uh, John the Baptist, Repentance in Jesus, repentance in the apostles was total, high cost, mortifyingly explicit, um, and required a total renunciation of the entire being, making one a slave of Jesus Christ, turning to the West and renouncing Satan and all his works and pomp, turning to the East and embracing the call of repentance, moral reform crucifying the old man, putting on the new man. We see the principle of separation. We saw that already in Qumran. We saw that with the Pharisees. That's not a logic of, you know, Christian cults. It's a basic principle of the how the call of God. You go back to the Old Testament, you can see this. You know, Israel was not allowed to mingle and marry other, you know, the, the Gentiles. Um, Achan in the camp, if you guys remember, was stoned because he was an infection that was going to bring havoc on all of Israel. Paul quotes the Old Testament when he says to the Corinthians they have to deliver an evil man away from themselves. This is a principle that goes back to Old Testament times, divine revelation. So Qumran and the Pharisees are just carrying on that basic logic. St. John the Baptist teach the same thing. Jesus taught that not all are welcome, 
that people are to be held accountable and that the local community should, they have to, they must expel, excommunicate, and banish people who refuse to live in the kingdom the way the king wants. If they refuse to hear the church, let him be unto you a heathen and a tax collector. I showed you how Basil interpreted that. It wasn't just exclusion from communion, exclusion from the praise of the church. It was exclusion from the whole community. I brought you to 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul talks about what the Corinthians must do. They're not even to associate with brothers who call themselves Christians, but who live in sin, not even to eat with them. So uh, I went through several other Pauline texts, went to uh, disciplinary actions in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, um, and uh, I took you to the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation as it's recorded by St. John. So, and then I, you know, I took you to, to, to instances in history, you know, major controversies like the Nestorian controversy. I could have gone into the Pelagians and the Arian controversy. I, I didn't. I didn't have enough time. We're already at two hours here. But I showed how Pope Celestine brought these principles and it used them and applied them in his management of the church during his day. And he was venerated as a saint and a hero for it. Then I showed you how the Fifth Council understood what the consequences would be if they maintained the communion of Pope Vigilius. They saw it as a way to be trapped to bear the sin and guilt of Nestorius. You see, so they had to, they had to announce that Vigilius made himself alien to the uh, fellowship of Christians, not just Rome, but the fellowship of Christians. Now, I have a whole book on this. You know, the, the, they curiously said that while they expel Vigilius, they maintain communion with the Holy See. It's a little quirky. But nonetheless, you see the principle I'm talking about in action. And then with Maximus, you see that Maximus was willing to die before even just communing. He was a layman, for goodness sake. And he would not commune with a patriarch that he thought was sinful because he said it would torment his conscience. And then when even told that Rome was going to communicate, he says that he won't even communicate then. Now, did he really believe Rome was going to communicate I don't know. I don't know. I've written about. I've written a document. I've documented this in my book. You can go see what I've said there. But uh, those of you who are interested, you know, make use of your time to go read that. So, all right, we reached the end. You know, um, my goal in this presentation was, you know, the title is to diagnose the problem in the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, some people say, oh, the problem is Vatican II, the German bishops, the popes, and the popes have been lax, and the this, this, and that. We could talk for hours and hours and hours about those things. What I wanted to do in this presentation was go back to the roots and expose the basic elementary principles of Christ, like the author to the Hebrews said in Hebrews 6. And I am laying again the foundations for the basics, the ABCs of repentance, judgment, separation, and church discipline. Things that were axiomatic to life in the kingdom, and nobody ever questioned them, and everybody thought they were vital. What has happened? And to those who might say, well, Eric, what you, you, you just lack, you lack the humanitarian, socio, political, cultural vision of the expanse of things that have changed from pre-Nicene Christianity and the, uh, the ascetic athleticism of the early church to the Christendom to the expanse of medieval Europe to the Reformation to today's postmodern world. You just don't understand. None of these things can apply today. Eric, don't you see? Yeah, I, I've had these conversations with these philosophers and theologians. And uh, 
Needless to say, I'm not convinced. One way or the other, the principles that we've covered about repentance, about the principle of separation, and about church discipline have to be timeless. They have to transcend culture. Because when Paul taught them, when Jesus taught them, when John taught them, when Peter taught them, it was talking about the application of the one true gospel, which is not subject to change. How it gets applied, yes. How it gets taught, I'm hesitant to say that that needs to change. How it gets taught, I'm sure there's different ways, yes. We're not going to go preaching about Christ as the priest according to the order of Melchizedek to people in Papua New Guinea, you know, like D.A. Carson taught. You have to contextualize the gospel. Yes, 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 I understand that. But those principles have to remain active. They can't go invisible. That's the point I'm making. That's why I asked in the stream, where are we today in contrast to what we read in my presentation? Are these principles even visible anymore? And if they're not visible, stop talking about contextualization and cultural differences. Where are they visible? If they're visible, show me where they are. All right, everybody. Well, um, thank you for listening. This was two, two hours, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time if you've made it this far. Um, if you want to know what Eric Ibarra thinks about the situation, this is what I think. we got to go back to the, to the roots, study the roots, study what's good, study what's true. And when you do that on these three issues, repentance, the principle of separation, and church discipline, you will see why, you will see how what we see today is in stark contrast, stark and utter contrast um, to what people say and do today. Yes, not just in the wider world of Christianity, but in Catholicism. You know, um, there are certain things that would never come up if we just understood these principles, things that would be uh, simply unthinkable that we allow today that would not exist if we understood these basic principles. All right. God bless you all. And uh, please share if you'd like, please, if you have any questions, concerns, criticisms, uh, share that with me in the comments section. Uh, God bless. Oh,